Hello everyone and welcome back to Flight Sim 2020 where I took a look at the experimental Dark Star challenge during a recent live stream and I also eventually did a separate flight to test its real capabilities. But first this is the challenge to fly from China Lake to Cape Canaveral crossing the entire country uh, mostly at Mach 9 hopefully. And you can see the phases, supersonic transition, scramjet transition and then of course the descent after we do most of the crossing. This is the interior of the experimental Dark Star. It doesn't have a very good forward view. <laughs> it's uh, sort of obstructed there. But there I've been planes like that, like the Spirit of St. Louis. And it's actually marginally better than the Spirit of St. Louis. So hey, uh, if the Spirit of St. Louis could cross the Atlantic like that, we can cross the country. Uh, we also have the little display in front there, of course, that makes it easier. So, we take off with afterburners. Uh, remember, the, the, the afterburners are activated with a separate button. Uh, some people on Xbox reported having issues, so keep that in mind. It seems to be an Xbox thing. I'm playing on PC, so... Anyway, we take off, and this is my first time in the plane, so... I decided to just go with what the objective said, and feel it out from there. So, Mach 0.9 they wanted us to climb at. And here we are doing the climb. It wanted us to maintain 20 degrees of pitch. And so I did that. And then once we got to a sufficient height, it'll ask us to transition to the supersonic. And do that by rolling inverted? Well, I, I'm not a big fan of the rolling inverted version of crossing the sound barrier. But, uh, so, but anyway, I did it roll inverted. On the free flight that I do later on to test its capabilities, I don't do this inverted roll. I cross the sound barrier the way I would with the Concorde or SR-71. It does involve pitching down. Uh, Concorde, I think, can actually break the sound barrier level. Uh, SR-71 tends to pitch down a little bit. It doesn't have as much lift in the wings by comparison. But this definitely needed to pitch down. And... We crossed the sound barrier, but I didn't hold it down long enough, it turns out. I pulled up a little bit too fast. You see it says maintain 1.2G pull up. I'm exceeding 1.2Gs there. So I'm pulling up too fast. And if I pulled up slower, I think we would have uh, accelerated more. And we really needed to get past Mach 2 right there. Uh, but I did not. I didn't want to lose more altitude, but actually we weren't too bad off on that, as it turns out. So yeah, that was my first attempt. and. The problem was, because we didn't pass Mach 2 right there, uh, we gradually started to lose speed, and I had to dip down again. So, I did dip down again, I decided to invert for the heck of it, because they said to. This is my first flight with it after all, and so this time I spent a little bit more time pointing down, and pull up much more gradually in order to make sure that we're at a high enough speed so that we eventually reach Mach 3. Uh, on the sort of jet engines that they have here, uh, this can go to Mach 3.75. And it seems to be a hard limit. It seems to be a sp uh, coded speed limit, uh, such that basically at Mach 3.75, the top end of my throttle range doesn't do anything. Uh, if I get down to about 50%, then it seems to throttle down. But basically, uh, it automatically limits it so that I guess because of stresses to the engines. After all, uh, the jet engines can't go faster than Mach 3.75. They'll choke or fry or whatever. Anyway, so here we are accelerating past Mach 2 up to that Mach 3.75-ish. Uh, that tends to float between 3.6 and 3.75. And we will climb to 120,000 feet. Uh, so it's quite capable of doing that on the jet engines or uh, probably one of those SR-71 engines. The form factor for this plane is sort of like the SR-72, uh, which is not a real plane, it was a design. Uh, but the flaw in that is that that's not really how scramjets are supposed to look. Uh, they generally are built around their engines, and I don't think anybody's trying to make one with two separate scramjet engines, which this has. This has two separate engine pods, which is weird for a scramjet, but Anyway, it is because it looks like the SR-72 that has that. So we had some uh, beacon lights to switch on and the fuel cell to activate. And then at 120,000 feet, I decide to activate the scramjet. And that's what that sounds like. And it takes some time to rev up. As it's sucking in the air and getting up to speed. 
Okay, and then we start accelerating past Mach 3.75, and we the main jet engines are not on. There are two sets of fuel tanks, it turns out. There's uh, four tanks for the jet engines. I'll call them jet engines. They're like turbo ramjet or whatever. Um, those engines, and then two tanks for the scramjet. And it's the two uh, very center line tanks that are for the scramjet. And that gets us to Mach 9. I decided to go way past 120,000 feet and level out past 200,000. And you can see it's going past Mach 8 onto Mach 9. This is the view from outside. We have a very tight Mach cone there. You can see the estimated airspeed there, uh, functioning basically like an indicated airspeed, just 250 basically. Remember that's how the airframe is taking the air, so we still need to keep that above its stall speed. But the true airspeed underneath that, you can see, is at 5,400 something. So the, the estimated airspeed doesn't take into account the reduced air density. Well, it does sort of, uh, because it's about the amount, basically you can think of it as the amount of air going across the airframe. And because we're in low density at this height, uh, that's still very low. The speed around uh, across the ground has to be very high for us to get enough air to remain in flight, basically. Uh, we are way past Mach 9 now, past, past Mach 9.6 there. So I'm exceeding the requirements, if you will. Uh, but I do decide to throttle down eventually and get a map up as well. I've got this uh, separate modded map that is sort of better than the normal VFR map. And you can see where we are over in New Mexico. And I decided to pull it back a little bit and sort of try to level out. I didn't break Mach 10, though it sure seemed like it could have. And get more to Mach 9-ish. Anyway, so we crossed the country. That was really quick. It's like 10 minutes. And we are already approaching Florida. And... It will tell me that I am reaching Cape Canaveral eventually, but I already uh, start descending down, back down to 120,000 feet because we were cruising fairly high. So I'm trying to dump all that height ahead of a landing at Cape Canaveral. Uh, we will want to line up the way that they intend us to, just for safety's sake. I don't want to have to try and figure out where the runway is when my forward view is obstructed. So anyway, maintain negative 0.3 G push. So it's asking us to descend now since it says we have reached the final bit. And so we are pitching down. You can see we've already slowed down a bit as we were descending. I have it already thralled down. And eventually it'll tell us to thrall down to idle. And there we go. So I do throttle down and we lose Mach speed very quickly in that case. It wants us to stay above 80,000 feet. That, well, we stayed above 80,000 feet for a brief bit, then it brought us down to 50,000 and then down to 10,000 now. And you can see we've gotten down to Mach 1 and finally below Mach 1. No severe problems doing that. And. It's basically sort of a fly straight in sort of situation here. And I had my track IR available, so I took a peek like this. Without track IR, I don't think it's very easy to do that. So I cheated a little bit there. But anyway, you can't do that while you're trying to make the final approach. So we have to rely on the little screen in front of us. Which I did, and this is how it turned out. I didn't know the stall speed of the plane really, so I just sort of had to feel that out. And it looks like it had a lower sp stall speed than I expected. It sort of floated above the runway a little bit longer. You can see here. So, try to bring it gentle. Uh, it's a little bit hard. Okay, we landed, and then we slowed down. So there we have it. We arrived at Cape Canaveral as planned and I completed the challenge. The ta challenge doesn't give a score, this one, unfortunately. I don't know what they would score on. Maybe time. Maybe they, uh, it should be a speed thing. But here, uh, I think this is the skid strip. I don't know. This doesn't seem to be the shuttle runway. Uh, but yeah, they have this little path, so I decided to follow it and taxi off and then set the parking brake. 
and then they told me that it took 41 minutes and one second and just gave me a check mark. I just got a check mark. I hate check marks. Anyway, but uh, yeah, no score on that one. Uh, so I could probably do it faster, but anyway, I decided to set my sights on actually going further because if you notice, we had a lot of fuel remaining on touchdown there in the tanks. So I wanted to see if we could go straight from Edwards Air Force Base to Heathrow. Uh, Heathrow being the longest runways I know of in Britain. So uh, yes, so this was an experimental flight in free flight mode. And here we go. I'll, I'll keep it short because it's just uh, telling you the experimental results. There was an odd clicking. I think uh, I, we, I didn't hear this in the challenge mode, but there's an odd clicking in this mode, which I think is the fly-by-wire adjusting the pitch trim, but because it's irregular, but I don't know why. And when I look down, it doesn't make that clicking sound anymore. So it's weird. Anyway, so here we are passing Mach 1, and I did it much more gently without any inversion or anything like that. Uh, so just the way I would normally bring a plane past Mach 1. And this time I made sure to just sort of stay level instead of trying to pull up until we got past Mach 2, and it was as simple as that. Actually, uh, because we had to descend twice with the previous mission, we used a lot more of the jet fuel the regular fuel uh, than I do here and that might have benefited me there because we ended up lighter when we turned on the scramjet. I don't know how much of an effect that had but it felt like we were slower uh, in this case because I used less fuel. Anyway, here we are activating the, ramjet, uh, the scramjet as the clicking continues and you can see Mach uh, 3.7 and then it increases beyond that and then we get to Mach 8.5 in the blink of an eye I think that's uh, the Great Salt Lake in front of us on the screen there and then we are over Montana also in the blink of an eye and we are on our way along the geodesic the Great Circle route from Edwards to Heathrow now on the map view when we had plotted the course you saw the boundary where it expects the limit for this plane to be about 2500 nautical miles and that is actually about right if you just take the initial ascent and then when it's gonna run out of scramjet fuel basically we ran out of scramjet fuel exactly where that boundary was the catch is we still have the regular uh, jet fuel and so we can still go Mach 3.7. As you can see, we are losing the speed and we cannot continue like this. But we can still go Mach 3.7 the rest of the way. And the question is whether we can get to London. And here I go transitioning back down. And we uh, it's really choppy during this part. It didn't like this, but eventually it's moved out. So we're going Mach 3.7 over Greenland and it would take uh, not quite an hour to get to Britain, but we did. Uh, I think it was like 40 minutes. I think the whole flight was like an hour and a half or something. So here we are uh, over the Irish Sea. I decided to stay over the Irish Sea. I would regret that. I ended up being a lot tighter on fuel than I thought I was as I descended. Uh, it's probably better to descend steeply with this just like they had it in the challenge rather than do a gradual descent like I'm doing here. So stay up, uh, I probably would have made Heathrow if I had stayed up high longer and then just gone down like 10 degrees or uh, even sharper in order to descend because the fuel efficiency is just really bad at lower altitude. So here we are eventually at Mach 0.77 and we do not have much fuel at all. I decide I can't make Heathrow like this so I look for a different airfield and we're sort of close to Oxford. I find one over there, but it turns out not to be a particularly large airfield. A EGTB it is, and EGTB is, as it turns out, a not well suited for a plane like this. So, but I, I didn't know that at the time. I didn't have time to look it up, so I just went with it. And I actually overshot it the first time, which wasn't a good sign and then came back around and lined up again and again we we're relying on the screen but I, I really can't make the landing here as you will see 
So the net result is that I did not quite make it to Heathrow, but I think I could have. So this plane is capable of going from the west coast of the United States all the way out to a cross-Atlantic journey to Britain or France or wherever. So yeah, I just missed that one. And I still totally overshot the runway. So the question is, how much fuel do I have now? Is us taking a look at the other possibilities around here. There aren't too many airports. So the fuel is at zero, actually. It's at zero. We're basically running on fumes. Uh, I didn't know it could do that, but it is running on fumes, and we last about 15 more seconds after that point, and then the engine quits on us. I, I wondered whether it would just keep going or not for a little while there, uh, but no, it did not just keep going. I thought maybe it was some sort of magic engine that, uh, oh, maybe they made a coding mistake. But, yep. There we go. A little bit more than 15 more seconds, I take it back. So, yeah, I was looking for another airport, but no. Nope, we are going to have to ditch, and that's not going to be pretty with all the trees around. So, yeah, we are going to crash. But there you have it, that was the experiment, and this plane can go much farther than the map view indicates with the 2500 nautical mile range. So, uh, have fun with it before they nerf it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if they got nerf it. They'll, it'll just be a curiosity, and I guess we'll have a lot of Mach 3 planes buzzing the tower or something. I don't know. All right. So, with that, with that experiment of the experimental Dark Star, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.